Now, in a brief discussion, as we're about to have tonight, naturally, we can't take so complicated a subject and give it a thorough discussion. But let us hit a few highlights. For example, let's try and answer these questions. What is the difference between love and infatuation? What is real love? What is it? Is there such a thing as love at first sight? What are the conditions for a love to develop? How is it possible to get someone you want to be in love with you? Is it possible? Yes, of course it is. You think you just find it by accident? Where I, I, you can't find it where I live, I've got to go someplace. Where are you going? I'm going to the Waldmere and to Grossinger's. And I'm going to look for it from room to room. One man knocked at the door at Grossinger's. A voice said, yes. She said, he said, Evelyn? Bertha? Sarah? She says, no, surely, but come in anyway. <laughs> Let's look at the difference first between love and infatuation. Have you ever seen a diamond and seen a zircon? They look alike. They look, they're not alike. They look alike to the inexpert eye. Are you in love? I'm in love, for sure, I think. Is this a real diamond or is it a zircon? There are distinctions that set love and infatuation apart. And I can tell you them very briefly. One, of course, is time. Love, ladies and gentlemen, can never be found full grown in one minute. There is no such thing as love at first sight. What a horrible thing to say to fall in love. What does it mean? You're walking along a hole, bang, right in the hole. I fell in. I fell in love. You don't fall in love, you march into it. Love is a creation. Anyone who wishes it may have it. But remember that since it is a creation, it isn't created in one moment. On television, yes. In the movies, yes. They fall in love at first sight because the program is only 26 minutes long. <laughs> and you may think you will find the same thing. Can a seed grow into a flower overnight? This doesn't mean, of course, that something that starts as an infatuation can't grow into a love. Of course it can. And thus you may not know that what you thought was love at first sight, and which was pure infatuation, eventually ripened into a love. Now, remember that then. Neither love nor flowers springs up overnight. Sam was about to marry Sadie from Yonkers, and his friend said, Sam, don't marry her. Everyone in Yonkers has made love to her. He said, so, is Yonkers such a big city? <laughs> now, which leads me to the next point, and that is, there is a very important physical element in infatuation that is not that important in love. The physical element is important in love, but it is not the whole thing. It is one link in the whole chain. Now, in infatuation, the physical element is very important. What does he look like? What does she look like? That's very important. And that, of course, sets off a sex attraction or a sex stimulation which the person thinks is love at first sight. Uh, it may be felt suddenly and can end suddenly. Love, as I said, always takes time. Now, why does love take time? Because if you knew what the definition of love was, you'd understand it. Love must be built gradually through experiences together, through conversations, through interests, through having certain things in common. And how do you find that out in 10 minutes? How do you know this? You can't. And so, of course, love is a developmental thing. It's an interplay of personalities. Just as a painting is a creation, so is love a creation. You may have all the paints, but you can't just throw them on the canvas and lean back and say, look at that gorgeous painting. It doesn't work that way. In love, then, as I said, there's a time element that's important. Infatuation is impatient. It can't wait. It wants what it wants when it wants it. Love is more patient. It knows it has many years in front of it. So. Forget this term, fall in love. It is a snare and a delusion. Of course, you will hear people pretend love by the different lines they give. Now, you know what the lines are. Uh, they're, they're, you can classify them. By the way, ladies, don't get upset when you hear lines. Uh, why must every fellow give me a line? When they first meet you, it is sexual. It is just infatuation. You can't expect love the first time. Now, by the way, before real love develops, you must go through certain phases. One phase is friendship. Unless there is that, the love can't come. It has to follow friendship. But when you first meet someone, as you do at a dance, for example, can you have a friendship? Can you have a love? Absolutely not. All you can have is a feeling about the possibility. 
is this person possibly a candidate? That's why men come to dances and they stand there and look all the candidates over carefully. And once they see that one over there, that's for me. You see a friend, that's for you. But you'll hear the different lines. I'm sure you've all heard these lines, haven't you? Now, so get the lines down and it won't bother you. Uh, what are the different lines? There are only four lines that a woman will hear, and I'm sure most of you have heard it. When a fellow meets you, for example, did you, especially if you go to the country or to a resort for two weeks, and you stay with one fellow for two weeks, which you should never do, never. This is a good waste of time, because it's the difference between the country and the city. He doesn't, you don't look the same to him in the city. Uh, so you may go for two weeks with someone in the country, and after you get interested, what is he likely to say? Baby, I'm no good for you. Now, this is psychologically a good line, because if you should ever marry him, and it turns out that way, he says, I told you so. Then, of course, there's a second line where he goes with you, and he says, won't you come with me to my apartment? Don't worry. I won't harm a hair on your head. He doesn't say what he'll do with the rest of the body, but not a hair on the head. One woman told me that a man she met here invited her to go to his apartment. He said he wanted to show, show me an old chest. It was his. Because he promised to treat me the way he treats his mother. If that's the way he treats his mother, someone should tell his father. Of course, then you will hear a very amusing approach that a man will give you. He may dance with you for a while and then press you close and say, you know, it's fate that we met. Let's live for tonight. She says, I'll hate myself in the morning. He says, sleep late. <laughs> now, please, don't, don't think that just men have lines. Girls have lines, too. I, I went out with a girl once. She kept saying to me all night, you know, you're different. You're different! I found out why. I was the only one who ever took her out. <laughs> now, another way that you know the difference between love and infatuation is the number of traits upon which the feeling is based. For example, oh, she's some dish. He's so handsome. Look at him, dark black hair, a little gray on the side, and a civil service job. Now, uh, <laughs> see, good looks are enough to stimulate an infatuation. It is not enough to keep a love alive. That's why men may go out with certain women and marry an entirely different kind of girl. What may please you for one night may not last you for a lifetime if it is just based on physical traits alone. Now, remember, too, that there is more than just pure sex appeal in love. Although it has that, it is not that alone. Real love, in order to exist, needs roots, strong roots. And those roots must come from many mutual interests. You cannot, if you are a brilliant person, go around with someone stupid and effect, expect to get an effective love affair out of it. Impossible. Sexual? Yes. Love? No. It can't grow. It can't, there's nothing there for it to take root. There is no common ground of interest. There's nothing you can share together. There has to be a complementation of personalities. Now they say opposites attract. Now get that straight, what's meant by psychologically by opposites attract. Now if you mean opposites by physical appearance, <laughs> okay, nothing wrong with that. But the more opposite you are in your personality to the other person, the more unlikely it is that you will ever be in love. And if you ever do think you're in love, the more likely it is your marriage will be a big flop. Because a good love affair and a good marriage and a good friendship depend upon as many things in common as possible. Age, education, intelligence, background, religion, all these things. Now, I'm not saying a man can't marry a girl 20 years his junior and make a successful marriage. I say that the chances are against it. The possibilities are against it. Because the more alike you are to that person, the more likely you are to find happiness and fulfillment and true love with that person. Because you're equal. You share things. That is why it is dangerous to marry someone who is not of your religion, whatever your religion may be, because there are differences in your upbringing, differences in your thinking, differences in your practices, differences in the way you feel and, and, and experience things. And so those differences will make strangers out of you. The more alike you are in, in intelligence and in education. You see, let us say you're a woman, for example, who loves all sorts of cultural things, good music, good plays, 
and you marry someone who the highest achievement of his cultural life is to watch Howdy Doody. And he loves the Lone Ranger. When are you ever going to share anything with such a person? When? What can you have in common? It is just impossible. The, you see, there is an illusion or a delusion if you think you are in love with such an individual who is so inferior to you. Now, it may be that you may fall in love with someone who is greatly superior to you, but it's very unlikely they'll be in love with you. Because there must be an equality. The more equal you are, the more likely you are to find a successful love.